Friday was the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The day was marked around the world. In Downing Street, Rishi Sunak took part in a minute's silence alongside Ukraine's ambassador to the UK. When Russia launched its attack, it was widely expected that Ukraine would be quickly defeated. But 12 months on, the vast majority of the country is still under Ukrainian control, thanks in part to the billions of pounds of military assistance provided by the West. To look back at the events of last year and discuss what could happen next, I'm joined now by defence analyst, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Crawford. Thank you so much for joining me today. So, it's been a year. Everyone thought this would be over in a matter of weeks. What happened? Well, I think, um, I mean, I thought it would be over in a matter of weeks when the whole thing started. Um, but I think Putin and the Russians made the classic mistake of underestimating their enemy. Mm. And the other classic mistake of overestimating the professionalism and capacity of the Russian armed forces, mm. which has been, they have been found sadly wanting, uh, which I think has come as a, quite a surprise to military or ex-military professionals like me, because I spent, you know, the best part of 15 years yes. in Germany facing the Russian hordes, thinking that, you know, we might stop them for five minutes. And now, of course, I'm not so sure because they seem incompetent. But you've been watching uh, these events unfold. And from a strategic point of view, what, what do you think have been the main blunders that Putin has, has done? Well, well, the main blunder was, was thinking that he could drive down the motorway to Kiev, decapitate the government, put in a puppet government, move in the Russian um, administration and Rus you know, re-Russify, re uh, if you like, the, the Ukrainian yes. uh, people. And I think that was a big mistake. Um, I also th think that he thought he'd be welcomed as a liberator in, s in some areas, which has proved not to be the case. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Zelensky has proved to be, I mean, a wonderful w wartime leader in his own way. Um, and in terms of PR, I mean, he's way ahead of Putin. Yeah, does, I mean, does this suggest that Putin is actually losing the propaganda war? Because, I, I, you know, obviously Russian state media has put out the idea that Ukraine is really a far-right uh, territory. There's all those kinds of mm. things. But... Putin's popularity is really, really high among Russians. Well, so it, is, it is high, and I think that's partly because, or m m perhaps mainly because, um, that, that, you know, Putin con controls the state media, mm -hmm. and they'll pump out really stuff that he approves of. Uh, he certainly hasn't won the PR war in the West or in the USA or in North America, uh, where Zelensky is a bit of a, a hero in many ways. Now, I know, I know Zelensky is not, and you'll know as well, he's not, he's not completely flawless individual. Hmm. But he has certainly risen to the occasion and proved his mettle. I mean, has a lot of it been his capacity to persuade other governments to support him? Because the sheer number, the amount, the amount of money that's been put into this yeah. war from the West is, is astronomical. Yeah, I think that, that's part of it. There is also a question of whether actually we're now involved in a proxy war mm. where um, NATO is up against Russia and the uh, Ukrainians are doing the fighting. It's not quite a proxy war because NATO is not necessarily directing the agenda or the strategy or the tactics. But, of course, what the Ukraine is trying to do is very much in NATO's interests. Yes. Hence the, the large amounts of uh, aid, both humanitarian and military, that's been going into to, to Kiev. But also there have been overtures for years about the idea of Ukraine becoming part of NATO and the EU. And, yeah. and that this is, I mean, to what extent do you think, I, I know Putin's whole <clears throat> argument for many, many years has been this possibility of NATO expansionism. Do you think there was anything in that, any merit to that? No, I think from, from a Russian perception there may well have been. I don't think uh, personally, although I'm being, unless I'm being very naive, that it was a sort of NATO, NATO strategy to expand to the east to constrain Russia and eventually overthrow the Russian regime. Uh, I think it's a matter of perceptions here. Yes. Um, it's, now it's going to be pretty difficult for Ukraine to join NATO, although I think in the end they will do. But of course the, 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 the thing that, uh, that Putin has got completely wrong, it, he didn't understand that by attacking Ukraine all the other bordering states would become slightly uh, concerned. And, yes. of course, now we've got Sweden and Finland um, applying and will, will join NATO eventually, and Finland before Sweden, I think. And, um, I mean, you know, he's, uh, that's completely counterproductive from his point of view. And if that happens, I mean, that's sowing the seeds of some very dangerous uh, things, isn't it? If they are part of NATO and Russia does breach those borders, then it becomes a global conflict, doesn't well, it? it beca well, it becomes a, yeah, certainly becomes a regional conflict, I, and pr most certainly, um, I think, also global, in term, at least in terms of naval uh, warfare. Uh, and, you know, if Russia takes on NATO, there's, I mean, there's no doubt about it, Russia will lose. NATO is f far, far better equipped, far more adept at military operations, and it's at, it's at the end game for Russia. And yet, a lot of people are predicting that China will increasingly become involved. I mean, they're already talking about uh, air, air support uh, for Russia from China. I mean, if that does happen, 
that changes everything, doesn't it? Well, it certainly it switches the dial uh, slightly higher. Um, Russia, t to date, has not sent any of what they call lethal aid to Russia, at least not that we know of, mm. from open sources. Um, and, of course, the there is this... Uh, conflict in, 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 the, in, in the Pacific, mm. where the US and China are not quite at loggerheads yet, but there's definitely competition there. I think if China does send large uh, quantities of weaponry to Russia, then it, the one thing it will do is prolong the war even further than I, than I thought it would ever end uh, last. So where do we go from here? What's going to happen now? Is this just the kind of conflict that there is no end in sight? Well, there's no, there's no end in sight yet. I think that... Um, uh, at the moment, we're going through a bit, a bit of a sort of operational pause while Russia is um, sort of reforming and recuperating and re-equipping and conscripting more soldiers, and that will take them some time. People say that the Russian spring offensive has already started. I don't think that is the case. I think they're mounting a number of spoiling attacks to prevent the Ukrainians going on the offensive. And I don't think the Ukrainians yet have the wherewithal to mount a proper, what I'd call a proper strategic offensive, mm. uh, which I think will be designed to retake Crimea. And I think Crimea is the strategic um, goal of, of both sides. You know, he or she who controls Crimea controls the Black Sea uh, and the entrance to the Sea of, to, uh, of Azov. And I think that if the, you, Putin won't give up, he will not give up Crimea. So Ukraine would have to take it. But I think, and I've always thought, that if Ukraine managed to take Crimea, then there might at least be the beginning of a consideration of peace talks. Is that the way out then, diplomacy, ultimately? Is it even possible? Well, it always is, and unless you go back to the Second World War and, and the Allies' demand for unconditional surrender uh, for the Nazi regime. I don't see that's going to happen anymore. Um, I, I think it's got to be brought to a negotiated halt at some mm. point, but at the moment I don't see either side being prepared to, to compromise. Yes. We haven't got to that point yet. Where that point is and when it might happen, uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't venture to guess. And a lot of commentators point, talk about Putin and the, the nature of his character, the nature of his ego and the idea that in order to win him round, it, it would have to look like he's had a victory. You know, yeah. what they call the golden bridge idea. You've got to give him a way out. Yeah. You've got to give him something to go to the Russian people and say, actually, this was all worth it. Yeah. Is that going to be the, the way that they... Well, it's, I think it's it. going to be very difficult because I, obviously the, the Ukrainians have a say in all that. Mm. But I've, I've sort of, I sort of mind-gamed the, the scenario where, whereby uh, Crimea is taken by the Ukrainians and then the Ukrainians might look at the Donbass or those Russian parts of the Donbass and say, you know what, maybe we can negotiate some sort of land swap agreement. But we're a long way away from that yet. Very interesting. Well, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, thanks so much for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. Very good, thank you. Thank you.